Hello and welcome to the Point World Affairs. I'm Cha Sang-mi. The third inter-Korean summit of the year will take place over three days in the North Korean capital of Pyongyang, starting on September 18th. The regional powers will be keeping close tabs on the result of this meeting, as denuclearization talks have reached an impasse in recent months. In today's special edition of the Point World Affairs, we will be talking to experts on the six-party talks hailing from each of the member states. One of them is with us today, Dr. Kim myung Research Fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you for joining us no, today. No, thanks for having me. Before we begin, let's have a look at the statements that were announced by the South Korean envoys who returned from their trip to the North. President Moon Jae-in is set to visit Pyongyang on September 18th for a three-day inter-Korean summit with his North Korean counterpart Kim Jong-un. The director of the National Security Office, Chung Ryong, who led a group of South Korean envoys to meet with Kim, came back with a set of messages from Pyongyang, which includes an agreement to open a joint liaison office at the Kaesong Industrial Complex. He also added that the North Korean leader expressed a firm will to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Kim Jong-un 위원장은 한반도의 완전한 비핵화에 대한 본인의 확고한 의지를 재확인하고 이를 위해 남북 간에는 물론 미국과도 긴밀히 협력해 나가겠다는 의사를 표명하였습니다. According to Chung, Kim Jong-un expressed frustration at the international community for questioning his intentions to denuclearize. This is all the more reason why many are anticipating what offer Kim will make in the upcoming summit between the two Koreas and possibly with the U.S. in the future. Neighboring countries are also carefully following the changes revolving around the Korean Peninsula. In particular, the countries of the six-party talks formed to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue are meticulously evaluating how the talks on denuclearization would eventually affect the security situation of their own respective countries. On this week's The Point World Affairs, we connect with experts from the U.S., China, Russia, and Japan to understand each country's position and what they hope to gain from the September Inter-Korean Summit. Let's see how significant is the Inter-Korean Summit for the denuclearization talks. The timing of the summit is very important because the denuclearization talk between the United States and North Korea, as you said, uh, it came to an impasse. And it doesn't seem to be able to get traction right now. So the timing is perfect for that reason. And, and I think President Moon is going to take to Pyongyang the message that uh, if North Korea commits to denuclearization, then the South Korea will really work hard to try to come to, you know, declare, I mean, sign the declaration of the, to end the war within this year, which is something that North Korea has been seeking to achieve. So I think uh, this is a very momentous uh, you know, event. It's going to really convey a strong message to, uh, to the domestic uh, South Korean public, uh, to the United States, that the inter-Korean dialogue uh, is actually uh, taking root. Right, you just mentioned about uh, the intentions of um, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, uh, but one of them is definitely he reaffirmed that he's fully going to denuclearize uh, the Korean Peninsula. So uh, what do you think about his intentions? I think uh, you know, the reaffirmation of this uh, fact it's, going to, it's actually a message for President Trump to proceed with the second step of uh, the agreement that uh, both of them reached back in Singapore, which is for the United States to proceed with pro uh, providing security guarantees, the first step of which would be the signing of the declaration of the end of the war. I see. So you're saying that uh, even though Kim Jong-un has repeatedly said that he will denuclearize, we don't know uh, how much range this will be and exactly um, which area he's really going to uh, commit to the denuclearization, whether it is just North Korea or the entire Korean Peninsula. So we have to understand that uh, you know, denuclearization has several different dimensions here. So there's a political dimension because uh, North Korea is, has developed nuclear weapons to uh, ensure the survival of the country and the regime. And there's also a technical dimension of denuclearization, which entails uh, essentially figuring out what kind of nuclear materials are there, what kind of nuclear infrastructure North Koreans have, and also what kind of weapons they have developed. So this is a technical part of denuclearization. 
Uh, I think uh, the process we have seen so far, the negotiations between South Korea and North Korea and the negotiation between North Korea and the United States, most of the, the negotiations and talks are focused on the political part mm -hmm. of denuclearization. Essentially, the part in which North Korea is seeking security guarantees in exchange for giving up nuclear weapons. So that's the stage that we are at right now. And then I think uh, uh, Kim Jong-un is reminding uh, the audience in South Korea and the United States that we are still at the political stage of the denuclearization. So there's no point in talking about, for instance, uh, talking about the nuclear list, quote unquote, which uh, is essentially a disclosure on the part of North Korea on the technical part of denuclearization. So I think that's the stage that we are at, and then I think North Korea keep reminding us that's the case, and there's no point in talking about the details for now. I see. So let's hear more about what the uh, foreign experts think about mm -hmm. this inter-Korean summit then. Sure. Great. Let's now connect to experts from the U.S., China, Russia, and Japan, all members of the six-party talks. We have Mr. David Maxwell, senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies from Washington, D.C., Dr. Tong Zhao, a fellow of, at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for a Global Policy from Beijing, Ambassador Gergi uh, Dalaraya from the Ruski Mir Foundation in Russia, and Professor Sachio Nakaru from Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto. Welcome, all of you. Now, this question is open for all. What significance does this inter-Korean summit hold for each of your countries, and what are your expectations? I think September is going to be the month of Korean diplomacy. And so the summit between uh, President Moon and Kim Jong-un uh, is very significant from an alliance perspective. Uh, I think that uh, based on what we have heard in the media, uh, that they may be laying the groundwork for uh, a declaration of the end of the Korean Civil War, which is, of course, very, very important. Uh, the, the, the friction, though, between the alliance is uh, that uh, North Korea has a different timeline than the United States. They want a declaration of the end of the Korean Civil War first, end of sanctions, denuclearization of the South, which means ends, end of the alliance, end of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula, and end of the nuclear umbrella over Korea and Japan. And then they will talk about dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear program. The United States, on the other hand, uh, wants dismantlement or at least substantive moves towards dismantlement uh, before uh, declaration of the end of the war and sanctions are uh, relieved. Uh, and so that is the, the, the real friction point. Uh, and of course, South Korea and the United States need to be uh, completely in synchronization with their policies and strategies. Uh, in order to ensure success. And so if South Korea moves out ahead with a declaration first uh, without the support of the United States, that's going to bring friction to the alliance. Now, Dr. Zhao, what do you think? I think uh, China wants to see a better inter-Korean relationship. Uh, first of all, that will help reduce the chance of another military conflict over the Korean Peninsula. And also, uh, China has a long-term interest uh, in uh, regional economic integration in Northeast Asia. If South Korea is able to forge a closer economic relationship with North Korea, that will also make it easier for China to enhance its economic and trading cooperation with North Korea. In the long run, I think China has this belief that the only way to fundamentally transform the North Korean society, to fundamentally address North Korea's paranoia, is to gradually open up North Korea economically, to build better and stronger economic and trading relationship between North Korea and the outside world. So promoting economic cooperation engagement with North, with North Korea I think it's a long-term strategy for Beijing. So Beijing wants to see all those things happen. Thank you. That has been Dr. Zhao from Beijing. And now to Gergi Dalaraya, who is the ambassador and a chair of project analysis, Ruski Mir Foundation in Russia. Uh, well, Russia has always supported the uh, strategy of uh, sorting out of, uh, of uh, deciding all the problems in, on the Korean Peninsula by dialogue and diplomatic ways. Uh, so uh, it's extremely important that two Koreas uh, should have dialogue and cooperation. And as long ago as during Kim De Jun's administration, No Mo Hyun administration, we strongly supported the inter-Korean dialogue. And we actually participated 
by suggested trilateral projects in this dialogue. Uh, so we are very much relieved that after uh, the end of the presence of Park and Head, the new government, Moon Jin government, uh, is very positive, both in relations uh, with North Korea and also with relation to Russia. And we are prepared to do all we can to facilitate the dialogue and well, uh, support the cooperation in every form possible. Thank you, Ambassador Tanlaraya from Moscow. And now we move to Japan. Uh, Sachio Nakaru, Professor of International Studies at Ritsumeikan University. Well, uh, if that happens, it is very significant, not only for both Koreas and U.S. Uh, North Korean relations, but also for Japan as well. Because if uh, South Korea and North Korea could promote a dialogue over the no uh, denuclearization issue, between the United States and North Korea, that has a positive impact on Japan because that helps Japan and North Korea engage in dialogue uh, regarding normalization issue. In that sense, uh, it is very important for both uh, leaders in both countries, uh, both Korea, to uh, initiate uh, this kind of uh, important facilitator uh, role. Now, let's get into more detail. David, inter-Korean relations have been the driving force behind America's relations with North Korea for the Singapore summit. Do you think this upcoming summit will help resolve the recent deadlock in the denuclearization talks? Yes, I'm hopeful that the summit can push things forward as long as the South Korean and U.S. Uh, uh, policies uh, and strategy are synchronized. We should go back to the June 30, 2017 uh, a joint statement between President Moon and President Trump. Uh, among other things, it said three things. Uh, denuclearization uh, is the principle. Uh, maximum pressure is the way that we're going to do that. And that South Korea would lead diplomatic efforts in North-South relations. Uh, and so we have seen that play out over the last year. And, and both President Trump and President Moon agreed to that. And we've had maximum pressure. You know, we're focused on dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear program, and President Moon has taken the lead in trying to uh, improve North-South relations. Uh, and so this summit can be a step forward as long as uh, there is agreement between the U.S. and South Korea on the way forward. Uh, if South Korea acts unilaterally uh, and the U.S. and South Korea are uh, have disagreement, uh, it is going to cause friction in the alliance. And we should keep in mind that there can be no success for South Korea, no success for the U.S. Uh, by acting unilaterally with North Korea. It must be the ROC-U.S. alliance acting in concert on the strength of their alliance, uh, a rock-solid foundation as, as the way forward that will bring success in dealing with North Korea. Professor Nakaro, Japan and the U.S. have been maintaining a good partnership when it comes to North Korean issues. But with Japan's secret meeting with the North behind the U.S. back is recently showing a dissonance with Washington. Some reports say that Japan is planning a separate summit with North Korea in November. As relations between Pyongyang and Washington grows apart, wouldn't it actually have a negative impact on Tokyo? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, Japan has a dilemma. Well, Japan is in a dilemma because Japan has to resolve the abduction issue as well. Uh, as well as nuclear and missile issues. Japan needs to cooperate with the United States in order to solve nuclear and missile issues. Japan cannot solve these issues by itself. But on the other hand, the abduction issue is solely Japan's problem. So Japan has to deal with this problem by itself. Yes, as you mentioned, yes, Japan is in a dilemma, but Japan needs to uh, both issues. In that sense, Japan needs to cooperate with the United States, but at the same time, Japan needs to deal with uh, separate issues from uh, the United States. Uh, so in order to uh, uh, more both, in order to attain both objectives, Japan needs to cooperate with, with the United States and needs to communicate with the United States very well in order to solve the abduction issues as well.
Thank you, Professor. It seems like all the countries are really interconnected. So mm. um, what do you think about uh, our President Moon Jae-in? Um, as they say, the denuclearization talks is at a deadlock, and he's trying to push for a mm. uh, future with, uh, with North Korea. So what do you think about South Korea's position? Well, the South Korea is not, not in an awkward position in my view. I think it can take advantage of this situation because I think uh, South Korea, for this brief moment, as an initiative when it comes to North Korea. I think uh, we have heard from the experts from Japan, United States, China, and Russia. And then, in essence, what they are saying is that they, uh, their, their country, their respective countries, are waiting on the wings to see what South Korea can do with North Korea to move their own process and uh, relations uh, with North Korea forward. So uh, I think it's, uh, the, what they are waiting for is some sort of breakthrough when it comes to uh, the U.S. DPRK talk, which is, which is at an impasse right now. I think uh, they are looking towards, uh, you know, looking forward to the, the South Korean President Moon Jae-in to somehow elicit uh, a strong commitment on the part of Kim Jong-un that uh, is going to totally denuclearize uh, North Korea. And then that could somehow that could create a ground to open the dialogue, actually uh, move forward with the dialogue with the United States so that uh, the United States can finally uh, re um, maybe uh, relax some of the sanctions that are in place against North Korea, and then the United States in exchange gets the uh, denuclearization gestures from North Korea. So the South Korean uh, President Moon Jae-in will definitely play a mediator role in terms of um, mm. connecting North Korea with all the other mm. countries. Well, let's hope for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Now to Dr. Zhao in Beijing. With the U.S.-China relations at its worst due to the trade dispute, China seems to be more invested in its relations with Russia, both politically and militarily. How do you think this will affect denuclearization negotiations? I think it will very much affect the denuclearization negotiation. Um, at the geopolitical level, uh, the U.S.-China bilateral strategic rivalry is growing very quickly. And China is very much concerned that the U.S. is now seeing China as its primary long-term adversary and is doing everything uh, to slow down China's growth to contain China's peaceful rise. Um, so given this focus on U.S.-China bilateral rivalry, I think China is very much looking at the North Korean issue increasingly from the geopolitical perspective. So the priority for China becomes how to make sure in the future, uh, North Korea will have a closer relationship with China than with the United States. In other words, preventing North Korea from being absorbed into the Washington's orbit is increasingly important for China. So geostrategic consideration becomes more important at the cost of upholding non-proliferation principles. It's another way to say, I think, uh, it, it, will, it will be increasingly difficult for US and China to have substantive and in-depth negotiation and cooperation to address North Korea's nuclear threat. I think uh, this is also important for North Korea. Uh, North Korea wouldn't trust any goodwill uh, from the United States in the form of security guarantee. But I think North Korea is very, um, North Korea knows very well that China-US mutual suspicion and the mutual distrust will grow and will deepen in the long-term future. So just North Korea is going to make the best, the most out of this growing distrust between Beijing and Washington. So the North Korean strategy depends on uh, balancing between the two big powers in this region, China and United States. How about Russia? Ambassador Talaraya, Russia is recently stressing its cooperation with China. Is it because of concerns that Russia is being excluded from denuclearization talks? Uh, what's your thought on that? Uh, well, you know, we have a sort of a, uh, a sort of you know, tacit understanding with China that China plays the uh, first role in Korean affairs and Korean Peninsula, and we support and participate in it. While Russia uh, is uh, playing the first role in the Western sort of Syria or Ukraine portion with support of China, 
Uh, of course, uh, Korean issue is very important for us, but there's no contradictions uh, between us and China on this issue because we both support denuclearization, we both support political and uh, diplomatic solution. We have the uh, interest in economic cooperation. Of course, China has much more. But anyway, we, uh, we uh, also support economic cooperation and uh, we are not much of a competitors in economic cooperation with North Korea. Uh, so, um, of course, it's natural that uh, Kim Jong-un feels to China as the most important uh, external player, uh, apart from the USA, in uh, solving the Korean issue. Uh, and uh, it is much better that the, uh, North Korea this year started diplomatic uh, offensive towards China rather than not having uh, much of relations as, as was the case in previous years. So Russia is actually relie relieved that the Chinese North Korean cooperation is developing. And also I feel that uh, the uh, not so strict observance of sanctions by China, it helps uh, North Korean economy. And thus it stabilizes the situation in uh, North Korea, which is also in our interest. Thank you all four of you from Washington, D.C., Kyoto, Beijing, and Moscow for your insights today. Thank you. China, they have been saying that is one of the key players when it comes to denuclearization mm. discussions. Uh, but there is a, there's this issue with uh, President Xi Jinping not visiting mm. North Korea for the September 9th mm. uh, event, which is the foundation day of North Korea. Uh, and it was an anticipated visit. So do you think, um, why, why was this canceled? And do you think this is maybe uh, too much of a diplomatic risk that China thinks so? Uh, uh, Xi Jinping's visit to Pyongyang uh, wasn't really officially announced, as it was been rumored, but then, uh, so it didn't really take place. Mm. And I think, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, it's exactly right. I think it was too risky for President Xi to, uh, to be seen side by side with Kim Jong-un when, at, at this juncture, when China and the United States are, uh, they, they're engaged in their own uh, confrontation over trade issues and other uh, uh, economic and security matters. So, uh, I mean, I think the fear on the part of the Chinese is that uh, the parade, the North Koreans could actually put on the display some of the, the weapons of mass destruction weapons, such as ICBMs and other uh, long-range missiles, and that could potentially convey a very negative message to Washington. So I think that's exactly something that uh, President Xi was trying to avoid. Uh, Dr. Zhao, though, he said that the distrust between China mm. and the U.S. will grow more in the future. But since we know that uh, all of these countries have mm. the same intention at the end of the day about peace and prosperity mm. on this Korean Peninsula and which will definitely connect to uh, peace and prosperity for their countries, do you think this uh, dispute between the two uh, countries, two superpowers, will actually continue? Well, definitely. I think it's going to continue because this competi strategic competition between China and the United States are uh, taking place along in many different dimensions, not just in the Korean Peninsula, but we know that it's also taking place in East China Sea, mm -hmm. in South China Sea, uh, not just in geographically, but economically as well. Uh, the two powers are fighting over the intellectual property issues, trade issues. So I think I mean, the list goes on and on like that. So it's, this is like, a, I mean, North Korea is one of the outstanding issues that uh, uh, the two superpowers have at the moment. But I think as Professor Tong has indicated, uh, North Korea is definitely very well aware of the fact that this competition actually is creating a space for North Korea to somehow take advantage of. Uh, I think North Korea is not trying to balance China with the United States. I think uh, North Korea is trying to exploit the schism between the two superpowers mm -hmm. to achieve which strategic objective of becoming, a, I would say, a regional power player. And, uh, and I think that's where they are right now. So I think in that sense, uh, I think North Korea is a very comfortable situation, I think. And then I think they keep trying to use that. And what the fear is that if we don't you know, recognize this uh, desire on the part of North Korea to exploit the standoff between the two superpowers in this part of the world, is that North Korea might take advantage of that against South Korea as well. What is one hope, if you have, for the inter-Korean summit when uh, the leaders of South and North Korea, Korea meet? Mm. What is the one hope that you want them to achieve? Uh, if I had a wish, I would like to for Kim Jong-un to really come up with a very uh, well-defined and well-described uh, list of uh, nuclear materials 
that North Korea possesses right now. I think that's going to really send a very positive message to Washington, and this is going to lead to a chain, a chain of events, a positive chain of events, which will actually culminate in signing a peace treaty with the North Korea, North South Korea, and the United States. So that's ex exactly the hope I have for this summit. Thank you very much. Let's hope it happens. Thank you for your expertise today. Ah, my pleasure. It seems like the third inter-Korean summit might be a definite turning point for the stalled denuclearization talks. With related parties and the whole world closely following this historic event, we'll be sure to keep you up to date on all of the subsequent developments on the next edition of our show. That's all we have for today. Thank you for tuning in and see you next week.